Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name's Dr. James Gill. I've recently stepped out of the surgery and back into the wilds for a spot of expedition medicine. I have a few ideas for videos whilst I'm out here, but this first one was triggered by a throwaway comment somebody made the other day saying, don't forget your sunscreen, you'll need net factor 95 out there today. And that caused a small question mark to go off inside my head. Is that a thing over here? Why would I? need fact 95 sun cream um, that got me thinking that perhaps both from a gp perspective but also from an expedition medicine point of view it might be worthwhile doing a video on the truth about sunscreen and why fact 95 probably wouldn't be as protective as you'd think he says as the sun comes out behind him but before we go any further, um, if you like the medical content that I upload on here, please consider sub subscribing to the channel. Only 10% of viewers on the channel are actually subscribers, and hitting the like and subscribe buttons tells YouTube I'm here and means that these videos can be shown to a wider audience. So if you'd be happy to do that, I'd be very grateful. So with that out of the way, here's the actual truth about sunscreen from a doctor who's also being chased around the beach by the sun in order to keep his light. But, if you're sitting comfortably, we'll begin. Now, dermatologists have an absolute love affair with sunscreen. Possibly viewing suntan lotion is more important than moisturizers. Possibly a sun cream can do the job of both. But I'm sure you're going to get dermatologists who will vehemently disagree with that. Regardless, the standard dermatology advice of put on sunscreen every day is a wee bit vague. It's a little bit like saying be active every day. That might sound good in practice, but without the knowledge behind it, it's a wee bit meaningless. I mean, you can argue doing anything more than merely getting out of bed in the morning fulfills the criteria to be active and exercise daily, but that's not really a good argument. But that's only because exercise and activity aren't clearly defined here. So let's just put that part to bed for clarity. When people are advised to engage in daily exercise, that's usually recommending anything that leads to a sustained rise in the heart rate and at an effort where the breathing increases, but you're still able to maintain a conversation. And to really make it count, you want that exercise to have a minimum duration of 20 minutes. And from that, it's fair to assume that applying sunscreen to my skin needs also a little bit more detail. Now, perhaps the first question which should be asked is, what sunscreen are we going to use? and how much SPF is enough. So let's be clear, protecting yourself from the sun isn't some modern health fad. Even the Romans did it. Any idea what ancient Romans used as sunscreen? Frankly, if it's probably going to be only one of two things, either the wine or olive oil, and I'm pretty certain that the Romans weren't nearly wasting their wine on their skin. So yes, Romans used olive oil to protect their skin, and no, they were not worried about skin cancer. It's just the fact that sunburn sucks. Interestingly though, as Romans didn't have soap, in order to get the olive oil off their skin, at the end of the day, they would rub fine grains of sand on their bodies and, here's the slightly surprising part, scrape it off with a crescent-shaped tool called a strigil. So the Romans used olive oil. How much protection could that actually give them? Surprisingly a lot. Olive oil has an SPF of about 8. But 8 what? What does SPF mean? SPF stands for Sun Protection Factor. And even though we know what it stands for now, I don't think we're any wiser on what it matters. So let's take a quick look at how we got into the modern world of sunscreen and try to answer that question for you. Now, I'm sure that someone has a grandparent saying, in my day we didn't need this stuff. Well, I tend to have a knee-jerk reaction to comments like that. You know, we didn't have Wi-Fi when I was growing up, but it doesn't mean I'm going to reject its internet bringing wi fi the goodness. But I can kind of see where some generations can come from when they say that. Why? Because commercial sunscreen didn't really become a thing until after World War II. After the US military found that simple petroleum jelly was a safe and effective sunscreen and started handing it out to soldiers in the desert. Because, again, sunburn sucks. And from there, an enterprising GI decided that he could sell the same stuff to the general public. And boom, you've got sunscreen for everybody. However, there was a bit of a problem with his new product, in that nobody wanted it. But why? Because people 
didn't sunbathe in the first half of the 20th century, really. But again, why? Well, because people actively avoided the sun in the first half of the 20th century. And previously, a sunscreen was looked down upon as a side of an outside labourer and was also, frankly, an expression of racism to the degree people would actually bleach their skin, feeling lighter skin was a show of wealth and privilege. But that's a whole different other ethical and medical tangle of problems we're not going to look at today. But wealth and privilege do come back into the story of sunscreen when we get to the 1960s and the advent of foreign holiday tourism, which paradoxically flips the tan from being something to avoid to something you wanted to cultivate, as now having a suntan shows that you are wealthy enough to travel and that you had enough time to lie around outside not doing anything. So at this point, there's no widespread concern about sunbathing other than sunburn because it hurts. So people started now to buy sunscreen because it meant they could cook in the sun for even longer and get a deeper tan. Our SPF numbers now start to make a little bit more sense as to how they're developed. As if we say the SPF stands for sun protection factor, it's literally a measure of the sun's ability to shield your skin from the sun's ultraviolet radiation. The number associated with SPF represents the multiplication factor of your skin's natural defence against UVB rays. So if your skin would normally start to burn after 10 minutes in the sun, by using an SPF 30 sunscreen, you can theoretically stay in the sun for 30 times longer without burning. Now, wealthy people on holiday can buy a cream which allows them to spend more time in the sun without burning, to literally work on that tan. But let's pull back from the cynical marketing for just a moment, so you can understand why I always recommend SPF 50. Might sound strange that I always recommend SPF 50 when I'm about to tell you that the SPF numbers are not linear. Higher SPF values do offer a little more protection, but the difference becomes less significant as the numbers go up. So SPF 30 filters 97% of UVB, while SPF 50 filters 98%. So on the face of it, it sounds like SPF 50 doesn't give much of a benefit over 30, so why do I only buy SPF 50 myself? As a side note, in the UK and Europe, there's not allowed to have a pricing difference based purely on SPF. Your same brand SPF 10 must cost the same as SPF 50 to prevent people being priced out of protection. So I only recommend SPF 50 because, here's the kicker, the advertised SPF number on the bottle is probably nowhere near close to the protection the person putting on the sunscreen is likely to get. Wait, what? Why is that possible? How is it possible? Well, in order to get the advertised 50 time protection, you need to apply the sunscreen properly. Now, Australians have a public health campaign all about sun protection termed slip, slop, slap. Slip on a shirt, slop on the lotion, and slap on a hat. Firstly, it's showing that sun protection is more than just about sunscreen. But also, when it does come to applying the sunscreen, that slop terminology is really useful in helping you put it on literally. You literally need to slather it on if you're going to get the advertised protection. So, if you're wearing your bikini or your budgie smugglers, a normal 200ml bottle should really struggle to last a week, maybe only three to four days before it runs out, if you're applying it properly. But like our previous issue of how much SPF is enough, how much lotion should we be using to describe it as properly? Generally speaking, we should be having what's called one fingertip unit, and that should be enough to provide a cover for the size of your hand. So one fingertip unit should cover most of the face. And then you need to reapply every two to three hours in order to maintain that protection. As a result, generally people don't apply enough sunscreen nor reapply it often enough. As a result, that SPF bottle you've purchased, probably because you're spreading it thinly to eke it out over the whole holiday, is probably only giving you SPF 20 or 30 if you're lucky. But wait, there's more. As medicine is so very complex, it's not just about the correct amount of sunscreen, but also how long you wait after applying the sunscreen before going out in the sun, which is really important to allowing sunscreen to function properly. Ideally, we want to slap it on 15 to 20 minutes before sun exposure to give the sunscreen enough time to bond to your skin and form a shield against the harmful UV radiations. 
Honestly, this is probably one of the most crucial steps with regard to sunscreen application. Because if you throw on a t-shirt immediately after applying the lotion and then run out of the door, a large amount of that sunscreen will have rubbed off on the inside of your shirt rather than getting absorbed and, you guessed it, thus reducing the SPF even further. Okay, fine. So we know the SPF that we want probably isn't the SPF we're getting. But does it really matter? Isn't sunburn just temporary discomfort? Well, let's look at it this way. Sunscreens work via two methods. The white chemical of the sunscreen, zinc oxide or titanium dioxide, is actually really important. This chemical is pure white because it works to reflect the sun's rays so the UV radiation doesn't actually get a chance to affect the skin. But because we're not all walking around like snowmen covered in sunscreen, those chemicals also have a secondary protection. They can actually absorb some of the UVA and UVB rays from the sun, stopping them affecting the skin, and that matters. I've always considered that UVA and UVB rays kind of do what they say on the tin. When it comes to damaging the skin, they both cause harm, but in different ways. The UVB is a higher energy wave and only affects the top part of the skin. So in essence, you could say UVB causes a burn. UVA, however, penetrates deeper into the skin, causing irreversible damage. What do I mean by damage? I mean UVA affects DNA. In essence, UVA causes aging, which means wrinkles, sagging skin, and sunspots. Nobody wants to look old before they have to. Oh, and skin cancer. Yeah, let's not forget, DNA damage causes cancer. So if we're gonna add a little bit more complexity, we know the SPF rating is only talking about filtering UVB and thus increasing the time before you'd normally burn. And burns are temporary, etc, etc. But the SPF rating doesn't make any comment about UVA protection. And that's to do with wrinkles, ageing and skin cancer. So the UVA rating is probably more important, but its score is only talking about vague protection and doesn't have the clarity of the SPF burn factor. In Europe, we use the star scale for UVA protection ratings from one to five. Four star gives 80 to 90% protection and five star gives 90% plus. And like the SPF factor rating, we're probably not putting enough lotion on in order to get that full um, protection. So hence why I only recommend five star UVA rated creams. But then again, I can't really grasp why somebody would want a cream that allows more aging, but each to their own, I suppose. So what's my takeaway about sunscreen? First off, don't buy less than SPF 50, nor five star rating, because the level of protection you're going to get is not what it says on the bottle, unless you go for a swim in it. Face, ears, nose and neck, really do apply that sunscreen with the one fingertip rule, and reapply sunscreen every two hours. But better still, try to keep your skin out of direct sun. Even though I'm putting on my sunscreen, 30 minutes before heading out to film this, I applied it correctly to my face. I'll still be putting my Ventures hat on because when I'm at work, I'm probably not gonna get the chance to reapply it properly. So with my hat, I'm literally keeping out of the sun. So there we have it. Try to enjoy the sun in a healthy fashion. And next time you shop for sunscreen, remember the SPF indicates the level of protection it provides from UVB and the UVA rating might not be so clear that's in the star rating there so i hope this has been a useful video for you if there are other things with regard to travel and expedition medicine you'd like me to do videos about please put us in the comments and uh, we'll see what we can do to help with that in mind take care and we'll see you in the next one cheerio